So for a long time, it was thought that uh, neurological diseases and mental health issues were due to a chemical imbalance in the brain. And this uh, chemical imbalance was treated simply by providing some of the chemical um, that was missing or dimming down the chemical um, that was overproduced. And um, for example, in the field of mental health, one of the best medications we have right now on the market, the SSRI, that are the antidepressants, um, were actually found uh, in the last 30 years. It has been, however, very difficult um, to find alternatives and new compounds for all of the various neurological diseases that are increasing in our population as the population is getting older, such as Alzheimer's disease uh, or Parkinson's disease and so on. For this reason, a lot of money has been pulled out of the neuroscience departments of many pharmaceutical companies. And the more we understand the brain, the more we realize that the brain does not have one level of chemicals all across the organ. The brain is actually a very intricate structure of neural networks that have various chemical levels in various brain regions. For this reason, um, the approach that is being used is now co being completely shifted by the arrival of the latest technologies. The arrival of new technologies revolutionized diagnostics and treatments using digital prescription therapeutics, for example, um, for addiction, or using um, data coming from your phone uh, to diagnose um, mental health issues, um, to detect a manic crisis for schizophrenics, or to diagnose tremor simply uh, from the geometer um, in your phone. Another topic is uh, neurostimulation. And this is, for example, one of the classical courses of treatment of Parkinson's disease, to implant an electrode deep inside of the brain and stimulate with electricity absolutely suppresses, um, to a great extent, tremors in Parkinson's patients. And this is happening without um, taking in uh, chemicals. One of the promises of neurostimulation is to actually stimulate not only various parts of the brain, but also various nerves in the body to target various organs. And like this, to free ourselves from chemicals with a lot of side effects, um, that are related to, um, to hormone producing organs, for example. One of the other strategies in terms of neurostimulation is to actually not only target various regions in the brain, but also to be able to target um, different nerves in the body. And like this changing the level of hormone production in, in, in all of the target organs. The stimulation does not have to be invasive. You don't need to actually cut through the flesh to be able to interact with the brain and stimulate it. For example, using a big magnet above um, the cortex of the brain through the skull um, is a way to induce an electrical current in the superficial layers of the brain. This is called um, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and it has been a course of action under research uh, for the treatment of depression and perhaps uh, autistic symptoms. The field of pharmacology itself is transforming using AI for predicting what kind of drugs will be able um, to act on various targets. This partnership between giants of pharmaceutical and AI, such as Sanofi and Google, is really promising for finding new compounds and helping solve the dry spell that pharmacology has been uh, living in the last 30 years of neuroscience. Personalized therapeutics is an amazing way to be able to predict how various individuals um, might be suffering from overlapping symptoms and to understand how they might react to various compounds. For example, in neuroscience, the creation um, directly from uh, skin cells that are transformed into stem cells, into pluripotent stem cells, and then um, transformed again into mini brains um, also called cerebral organoids, is a great way to understand what compound will work on which type of individual. Technology heavily helps us to understand various markers of diseases using, for example, wearables such as smart souls. One is able to uh, understand recovery, uh, have digital clinical trials, um, and even able to give some uh, biofeedback through the feet. 
I've always been passionate about neuroscience. I discovered neuroscience when I was 16, uh, borrowing a book that I thought was a philosophy book, uh, but it was in fact uh, a neuroscience book called The Nature of the Spirit. And it really made me discover um, from the other approach, from the approach of cognitive neuroscience, how are decisions made? Uh, do we have free will? Uh, how do we um, control our uh, motoric behavior? How are we able to, to um, grasp an object uh, or to remember something or to perceive um, a color or a sound? And uh, this led me to study uh, neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience more specifically during my bachelor's, uh, master's and PhD. I soon got interested in uh, neural networks, which are the connections uh, and the activity of the neurons in the brain. And I discovered uh, that there are a lot of technologies that are either emulating or interacting with these neural networks. What is truly fascinating is that uh, these neural networks um, are constantly active and interacting with the environment. And this constant interaction between the brain and its environment is um, on the rise of a technological revolution nowadays. And this technological revolution is happening in various ways. The first one is through designing um, products that we interact with the human brain. In this regard, we are trying to create products such as videos or objects that will be tailored um, for our senses in a way that we don't have to spend too much energy trying to understand what kind of information it brought to us. For some of these technologies, such as artificial reality, it is absolutely important that we understand the way the brain is processing this uh, visual information. For example, um, there is a development for artificial reality being used uh, in surgeries uh, in human patients. And in this case, the idea is to overlap the anatomy that we are looking into, um, into the, the patient on the table with uh, the anatomy of medical images, um, for example, of a tumor that uh, we got through uh, medical exams. And it is absolutely important, um, not only that this overlap uh, works well, but also that the motoric skills of the people performing the surgery uh, works well. And some of the latest studies have shown that there is a displacement that goes up to um, four to six millimeters in terms of uh, surgery while using artificial reality. Um, and this displacement is uh, not seen without the Googles. So, um, it might seem a small number, but actually six millimeters is quite a lot when we're, um, when we're trying to plan a surgery on a small um, brain structure, for example. Another example of uh, how we should use neuroscience to tune perfectly uh, stimuli in artificial reality is uh, what is called the virgin's accommodation conflict. This means that when you're having uh, Googles and you're looking at something uh, visible on the Googles and at the same time trying to focus on uh, an object or a landscape that is uh, further uh, in the environment, you have what is called um, a conflict between trying to focus on something close and something far at the same time. And uh, this provokes some um, discomfort to the people using these kind of technologies. And this is one of the examples where a neuroscience can really bring a lot uh, around new technologies. We're seeing a huge technological revolution in neuroscience, but this is not only going one way. We're also going to see a neuroscience revolution into new technologies. Another point in which uh, neuroscience will have a huge effect on current technologies is that the brain, through millions of years of evolution, has perfected to a very energy efficient um, machine that is able to navigate through space, that is able to make decisions, to perceive uh, contrasts um, and to uh, feel emotions. And this perfect lightweight, um, low energy machines are present in insects as small as a worm or, or a fly. Looking at these neural networks, looking at how the brain of such small animals are organized is a really great inspiration for creating artificial neural networks that are also energy efficient and 
efficient in terms of computational costs. When we think about artificial intelligence today, um, we cannot help but uh, be in awe in front of what it has achieved in the last 10 years. However, they are still, um, they are still quite energy costly and they need a lot of data to learn. And this is something that even super small brains, such as the brain of a fly or the brain of a worm, is able to do without needing thousands of examples. Um, all of these um, small animals, small insects, were able to evolve after hundreds of millions of years of, of, of evolution. The, the nervous system was able to produce all of these energy efficient small neural networks that are able to do so many different functions. And getting inspired from these insects, from these animals, uh, from the way the brain works, is a great way to improve our existing artificial neural networks. There are a lot of um, great examples of um, applications uh, being found by uh, research. For example, um, the most obvious ones are drones flying autonomously inspired by how the bees are going around in their environment. Another one could be um, reproducing certain parts of the brain, such as the auditory system, to um, detect when, uh, it's in manufacturing, when the machine is going wrong. So in conclusion, studying the brain is a great asset to understand how the specific connection between the neurons and how they communicate with each other could be implemented and emulated into our new technologies. So in conclusion, studying the brain is a great asset to understand how the specific connection between the neurons and how they communicate with each other could be implemented and emulated into our new technologies. The last point is directly interacting with the brain. For example, using intracranial brain-computer interface. There were great examples of this in the latest news. Um, a lot of big companies such as Facebook or um, Neuralink, which is the company of Elon Musk, who launched already the Tesla and SpaceX, are on the race to interact with the brain directly. The idea is to, um, instead of using the intermediate of objects to make us um, process information or feel certain uh, sensations, to directly stimulate the neurons in the brain uh, and be able to provoke um, sensations or to uh, read uh, the information that is being produced. Some famous examples are brain-computer interfaces for controlling uh, objects such as uh, robotic arms. Another example is using speech recognition by putting electrodes into the brain and leveraging the power of AI to decode the signal um, that is produced by someone who is not able to speak but who is producing a speech in his mind. So we've seen together how um, technology is making a huge revolution into neuroscience. From AI for automated drug discovery up to digital therapeutics, uh, we really know that technology will be one of the main uh, stakeholders for treatment uh, in neurological diseases and mental health issues. We've also seen that um, neuroscience is not only a recipient of technology, but also a disruptive um, aspect of new technologies. With the help of neuroscience, we will be changing the way we interact with objects, changing the way um, our AI is made, and also changing the way we interact with each other, solving problems by maybe connecting our brains together, solving problems through collective intelligence with the help of brain-computer interface. Now, how do we get there? There is a huge gap between the moment science is discovered and the moment where it is turned into something that people can use. This gap is called the discovery delivery gap. In Europe, for example, we are very good at fundamental research and fundamental science. And there are more and more initiatives for grants that involve the participation and the collaboration of private and public actors. For example, the European Research uh, Council is delivering grants where there is at least a minor involvement of uh, private companies. However, we noticed that some of the communication between the world of science and the world of technology, and even more with the world of business, is quite difficult. 
One of the reasons is that it's very difficult to explain science to people who are not in the same field as you, let alone in the same uh, scientific environment as you. One of the ways to improve this communication between the world of fundamental research and the more world of more applied research and even tech makers and private companies is to kind of watch our language. And the way to do it is to train every scientist to be able to simply explain what they're doing. To start this uh, initiative, we launched the Brainstorms, which is a um, collective of neuroscientists putting into their first value to explain science, to communicate it, and to create bridges between the world of uh, business and the world of science. Communicating science is one of the duties of scientists. Of course, scientists have a lot to do, but there is a lot of skepticism arising in society towards already verified and known uh, scientific facts. And some of this skepticism comes from the fact that um, it's not quite easy for, let's say, the general population to really understand what is going on in research labs and, and to be in touch with the latest developments of research. So we accumulate a lot of knowledge. And if you look at platforms such as uh, Google or PubMed, you will see that each scientist has a subgenre of specification um, and, and we publish in this uh, little niche. However, we still haven't found any better way to leverage all of these different fields of knowledge but collaboration. And collaboration is possible when people are able to kind of speak the same language at a similar level. In average, academics are often underpaid, overworked. They often have to do a lot of paperwork, fill up grants applications, and they often drift away from doing something that is interesting to them. What we want to do is to show that doing something that is interesting to you and understanding the leveraging potential of the technology you're trying to develop is going to make this academic career a desirable career.